It is now 6 p.m. on August 15, 2023, and I'm going to call the City of Iowa City formal agenda meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alter. Here. Burgess. Here. Dunn. Here. Harmson. Here. Taylor. Here. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. All right. Well, welcome to everyone in the uh, council chambers and to everyone on online. We're going to move on to our first agenda item. Um, well, actually, our second through seventh agenda item, which is our consent agenda. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Taylor. Second, Harmson. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Harmson. Um, anyone from the public like to discuss any topic that is on our consent agenda? Seeing no one in person or online, and if you're online, just please raise your hand. Uh, we will go to council discussion. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. On to item number 8, which is community comment. This is an opportunity for people to speak on a topic that is not on our agenda. If you are in person here, please raise your hand if you would like to speak at this time. And seeing no one online as well or in person, um, we're going to close com uh, community coming at this time. We're going to move on to planning and zoning matters 9A, rezoning 614, 622, and 630 Orchard Court. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 1.63 acres of land located at 614, 622, and 630 Orchard Court from low density single family residential with a planned development overlay to Riverfront Crossings Orchard. And I'm gonna open up the public hearing. Uh, Mayor, before uh, Ms. Sitzman uh, proceeds, I believe a couple of the council members may wish to make a statement about uh, their uh, participation in this hearing. Great. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'd like to, to, to state that I'm aware that the property owner's attorney has asked for my rec recusal based on discussions I had with the developer following the last rezoning application. And I would like to say that I have not prejudged this rezoning application and can remain fair and impartial in its considerations and thus will not be recusing myself. I do, however, look forward to hearing from the staff, the developer, and the public before making my decision. Uh, thank you, Councilman Thomas, for your comments. Uh, I appreciate what Councilor Thomas has to say because uh, the property owner's attorney uh, has also asked for my recusal in this matter based on discussions I had with the developer following the last rezoning application. Councillor Thomas and I did indeed meet in good faith with the developer to share thoughts about the project. I believe that I can be fair and impartial in consideration of this application. For that reason, I will not be recusing myself from voting on this and will be voting without prejudice. I will seriously consider what I hear from staff, the developer, and the public when making my decision. Thank you. We're going to um, get comments from our staff, and if the developer or the applicant wants to come up um, after, they can certainly come up at that time. So um, welcome, Danielle. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Danielle Sisman, Neighborhood and Development Services. So as the Mayor uh, read, the title of this action is for a rezoning of 614, 622, and 630 Orchard Court, shown here in the white outline. The applicant is Ryan Wade of M&W Properties, and they're requesting the rezoning of the remaining 1.63 acres of the Orchard Subdistrict for future redevelopment. The property can, currently contains three multifamily buildings constructed in the early 1980s prior to the adoption of the form-based code. Um, this shows the current zoning uh, of the property and the property surrounding it. Um, the areas in purple are what are our form-based code districts. There's two different ones represented in here, although they're, they're both shown in purple. So the Orchard District is the RFCO zoning, which is immediately to the east and south of the subject property. A little bit farther east of that, also in purple, is the RFC uh, West Riverfront. So the WR, if you can see that in the very small yellow uh, labeling, is a different 
subdistrict. Um, each subdistrict in the form based code has slightly different um, form regulations. Some have different, slightly different use regulations. They definitely all have uh, different height regulations. So we'll just be talking about the orchard district tonight. Um, the application represents a smaller portion of an area recently requested for rezoning. The rezoning uh, will complete the land use vision for the adopted downtown and riverfront crossings master plan for the Orchard District, as I mentioned, that uh, O district. No concept for redevelopment is included in this request. The subject property does not contain any sensitive land or features regulated by the city code, such as woodland slopes, wetlands, stream corridors, prairie, prairie remnants, or, ar or archaeological sites. Um, again, talking a little bit about the past history of the property, um, in 2016, this area was included in the downtown and riverfront crossings master plan. It was an amendment to that plan to add the orchard district. And on this map, it's shown as a kind of um, all mustard yellow color on the far west side. Um, you can see it uh, just uh, towards the middle as it follows the rail line there. Um, because it's a form-based code district, it actually needed to have a code language adopted specifying what those form-based code regulations would be. Those were added to the city's zoning ordinance in 2017. Uh, at the, about the same time, one of the properties in the district was rezoned to Orchard District. That's 627 uh, Orchard Court. So as shown here, the just the east of the subject property is that a property that was developed under the new regulations. In 2018, a portion of Orchard Court and Benton Street was also rezoned to Riverfront Crossings uh, Orchard. Um, that's the area to the south. And then uh, in 2022, there was a request to include that uh, portion as well as the subject portion in a re-rezoning uh, for the southern part and a um, rezoning just uh, for the northern part as well. That did not pass city council. It need needed a super majority to pass. So just a little visual history again. Um, the property to the east was rezoned in 2017 here on the left-hand side shown in outline. The property to the south was rezoned in 2018 and still uh, has a valid re uh, riverfront orchard rezoning uh, placed upon it. Um, the failed rezoning on the left-hand side here was both the south and northern portions, and tonight's rezoning is simply the northern portion. As with um, rezonings, most rezonings that are not OPD rezonings, there are two general cr criteria that are reviewed, consistency with the comprehensive plan and compatibility with the neighborhood. In regards to um, comprehensive plan consistency, the current vision, uh, district vision for this plan area is the downtown and riverfront crossings master plan. Um, if there are previous plans that maybe or, or studies that may have been done in this area, they were overwritten by that comprehensive plan uh, process and as it was adopted in 2016 for the subject property. The district was specifically adopted to incentivize redevelopment of this area. Um, encourage redevelopment to address conditions of the area which were negatively impacting the public realm for walking and biking as well as um, other folks living in the area. Uh, the conditions at the time included duplexes along Orchard having very auto-oriented frontages uh, with large garages and driveways, older single-family homes having no street frontage or pedestrian access. Um, you can see that probably a little bit on this slide. There's some houses uh, just n not along Benton Street, but just the next row in from that, uh, north of Benton Street, that are nestled behind it. Uh, the neighborhood uh, frontages, so they have actually no access to streets. And abrupt changes in um, low-scale development from the single-family neighborhood to the west to very high-intensity uh, West Riverfront form-based code districts that were developing in 2016 along Riverside Drive. So this Orchard District was intended to be a transition between those two um, and to incorporate forms that were appropriate for a transition. The rezoning would encourage redevelopment, create a transition and improve design quality um, based on the elements that were incorporated into the regulating plan and the code language itself for the form-based code. Um, those transitions are expressed in the form through limits on height. There's a limit of three stories um, in height in this district with no uh, option for bonus height to be added to that. It does restrict the forms of the buildings to more um, smaller forms, forms such as the um, 
I think I'll talk about those a little bit more of the existing compatibility of the existing neighborhood. But it also includes uh, stringent design requirements. So form-based code uh, does require design review and has some very specific elements that are reviewed uh, for elements of buildings that address the street, the frontage, the fronts of the buildings, their entrances, um, and the layout of, of course, parking and things like that. Uh, the subject property could not be redeveloped under its current OPD zoning. Um, and in this case, the, the present application, the rezoning would specifically implement the master plan. So the consistency with the comprehensive plan is uh, baked into its design. And in fact, would be this zone would be the only uh, zone that staff feels is consistent with the comprehensive plan. So moving on to the second criteria, which is comp compatibility with the existing neighborhood. Uh, by design of the regulating plan and the text of the zoning code, any code compliant development that follows through on this riverfront crossing orchard zone would be compatible with the existing development based on, again, as I said, those design elements that are baked into the code. Um, there are fewer uses allowed uh, in this uh, orchard uh, subzone than other riverfront crossing zones. The allowable building forms include cottage homes, row homes, town homes, live work town homes, and low rise multifamily buildings, all of which are meant to be on the scale closer to single family forms. There is, a, as I said, a three story height maximum, uh, maximum with a 10 foot step back above the second story. Um, and then again, as I said, no bonus height is allowed. There's also an enhanced or a greater setback required when adjacent to RS8 zones. And there's some limitations on the number of bedrooms and the mix of uh, three bedroom units that would be allowed. Um, in 2018, there was a traffic study completed to uh, look at the impact of the redevelopment potential of the southern uh, property adjacent to this and how uh, it would impact both the immediate intersection and the intersection slightly to the east of Benton and Riverside Drive. Um, at that time, uh, it was determined with the southern rezoning that it would be an acceptable amount of change, not to necess necessitate any changes. However, with the addition of this additional land to the rezoning, um, there is a need for signalization at this time based on that traffic study. So with the development, full development of, of the rest of the Orchard District, there would be a need for a traffic signal at the intersection of Orchard Court and Benton Street. So included in the conditions of, of the rezoning are um, public improvements on, at the um, that the developer will need to complete at the time of that development. And I'll go through those conditions a little closer to the end. So just a little bit of a background review again and where we're at in the process. Um, as I said, there was a master plan ad adopted for the vision. There was implementation of that master plan through the Riverfront Crossings Form-Based Code District, specifically the Orchard Subdistrict, and following that. There was this uh, two rezonings, and the third one um, that just recently failed, and then in blue is the rezoning of the uh, only the northern portion, as I mentioned. All of the conditions that passed on the southern portion would still be in, fact, in effect for the southern portion, and the conditions written for this rezoning would only apply for the uh, subject property. After the rezoning is completed, the steps that would be uh, in the development process would include primarily administrative and staff re review steps. Those include a site plan and a form-based code design review, as well as building permits. Um, we have received a, a signed CZA uh, from the applicant tonight, so um, the approval um, was based on, or the recommendation was based on a review of the relevant criteria as I've gone through tonight. Staff did recommend approval, and at their meeting on July 19th, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and voted 5-0 to also recommend approval of the rezoning. Now that CZA does include several um, conditions. They are related to the construction of public improvements, specifically a five foot wide sidewalk along Orchard Street or Orchard Court frontage. Um, as I mentioned, the traffic signalization at West Benton and Orchard Street and reconstruction of Orchard Street as necessary with those improvements. That concludes staff rep uh, report and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question about um, the traffic study for signalization. What was the tipping point that took the first recommendation from no signal to signaling. 
So traffic studies are based on traffic counts, and traffic counts and traffic trips are based on unit counts or estimates of those. So with only the southern portion developing, the number of trips generated was such that the level of service of those intersections was still acceptable. Adding in the additional units and the additional trips those units might generate degraded that level of service down below the, the threshold to warrant a signal. So it may have been... Uh, you know, it's, it's always an estimate, so it may have been even with some development necessary, um, but it was clearly necessary with the additional development proposed with this rezoning. The types of uh, people anticipated to occupy a unit, does that go into effect at all? Um, because if these are going to be students, we, there could be a decrease. I th the estimates are very generally um, calculated. They're not as fine-tuned to specific demographics. Um, you might see a difference in trip generation for folks that just don't drive as much, period. Um, but I don't think that a student population necessarily versus a typical apartment um, would have a distinction built into it. So um, they're very general estimates, and they tend to be based on worst case. And then another last question. Because there's a signed CZA, um, for this condition, there will be, let me see, so there is kind of a, you know, Orchard is kind of tucked away from the, it, from Benton Street, so the signal, signalization doesn't have to be done at the same time because there's no other improvements right there. Has there, any been, has there ever been a time where, or is it possible to have that condition um, present, but only used after the fact to see if it's actually needed. Uh, I suppose it could be wordsmith that way, but it's much more difficult to have a developer remobilize resources um, once they've left a site and already developed. So they tend to be timed with, uh, you know, cost savings for construction and impact on the neighborhood. You don't necessarily want to disrupt everybody's lives again once they've moved in with having to have a pretty major intersection um, shut down or restricted to make those improvements. There are lane changes and curb uh, changes that have to go with the signal. So it's not just a matter of putting a pole and some lighting in. Um, it is an offsite improvement, which is why it's in this uh, conditional zoning agreement, because it will take a little bit of thought for them to do, uh, potentially, if the northern and southern portions eventually develop at separate times. But this is our opportunity to, to tie it to the rezoning at this point, kind of the last chance with the rezoning. Thank you. Hearing no other questions, thank you. Anyone um, from the development um, group would like to speak? My question is, can I <coughs> wait to speak until I hear this, this council's rebuttal? No, you'll be allowed to speak at this time. I yeah. have nothing to say then. Thank you. Okay, great. And just for the record, will you state your name and who you're with? Ryan Wade with m and Properties. Thank you. All right, so I'm assuming that there is no comments from the developer. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Um, if you're present, um, I ask that you come to the podium. There is a sign-in sheet. Please give your name and uh, the city you're from. Seeing no one in council chambers and seeing no one online, uh, before I close the public hearing, I'll give one more opportunity for anyone uh, to make comment from the public. Seeing no one in person or online. I just want to make sure you weren't going to close the public hearing until you look for an informal consensus. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I wanted to just uh, talk to my counselors now. Uh, Counselor Dunn, I can't see you, <laughs> but I, just I'm wondering if people are inclined to vote with PNZ. Just wanted to get, um, all right, so I do see a majority here, and I'm going to close the public hearing, and all right, could I get a motion to give first consideration? So moved, Alter. 
second, Burgess. All right, council discussion. Well, I'll, I'll start off the um, council discussion. Um, you know, I will be supporting the project. Uh, it's uh, with, with the support, of course, as it's uh, the way we're moving forward, it would be a staff review uh, of any site plan developed for a subsequent project. As of now, we have no project, so there's nothing. This rezoning is not conditional on, on a site plan. Um, so in terms of looking forward to a future project, I, I did want to mention uh, some thoughts I've had regarding that process since the council will not be involved uh, with this approval with that future development. And, you know, it has it, there are concerns and comments related to the site plan. Uh, because the, the site plan, in my view, is kind of critical to the, to the outcome of the project. And there, there are a number of elements that go into the site plan. I think the, most of our discussions to this point have focused on the buildings, uh, particularly with respect to the, this notion of the, the, that the project uh, be uh, compatible in massing and scale uh, with the residential neighborhood to the to the west, and that this this project would serve as a transition. And you know, as was noted uh, with the previous application, um, the the code, the zoning code, requires that no building exceed three uh, three stories in height. Uh, so it's a height limitation. Uh, and the comprehensive plan is speaking about massing and scale. So there, there are two different means of evaluating building size with, with that. So there's a certain um, lack of clarity, if you will, in terms of how that transition is made. The comprehensive plan is talking about massing and scale. The, uh, the zoning code is talking about building height. Uh, this, this is a residential zone. Um, it's not mixed use like, like the other sub-districts within Riverfront Crossings. And, and subsequent to this rezoning of Riverfront Crossings uh, with the South District and uh, the Aurora District, issues related to mask and scale were integrated into the zoning code. So there was a, a, a greater emphasis on, on the, the, the means by which the comprehensive plan was asking for a transition. Um, so what, what that suggests to me is, is where we are, where staff will be, and where the developer will be, is trying to understand through using judgment how that transition can apply to, 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 this, uh, to this project. So there's some flexibility there, in, in other words. Uh, the, the, the other, some of the other elements uh, that I think make up a site plan that I would like to emphasize would be uh, the question of open space. And it really wasn't clear in the previous proposal if open space had been um, included in the site plan. And I just want to emphasize that in my view that the open space is a critical element uh, with this, this project, and it actually is written into the code. There is a 10-foot uh, per square foot requirement for e every bedroom that's, that's included in the project. So there is that requirement. Um, I, I certainly would emphasize the need to not waive that requirement, um, partly because of the, the high density that's being proposed. I, I would also add that if in using the open space, that, that can be a way of designing the buildings uh, so that their mass and scale can be um, modified, if you will, modulated in, in a fashion to reduce its sense of mass. Uh, one example is uh, directly to the east of, of the Orchard District, uh, the project that's um, you know, facing Riverside Drive. The, the building is designed in a U-shape. Um, 
the building wings that enclose an outdoor space. And what that does is it satisfies the open space requirement, but it also uh, breaks up the mass of the building and um, for the, also uh, increases the, the natural light that can access the, the dwelling units and provide views uh, as well. So there's, there's opportunities, uh, in, in short, with, with the open space to begin to address the massing and scale question that was raised uh, in the comprehensive plan. And then lastly, uh, the, the pedestrian uh, circulation and amenities, I think, are really important as well. Uh, that's, I think that's covered in the, in the um, comprehensive plan, in the, in the guidelines. Uh, again, it wasn't clear to me in the previous proposal the extent of the pedestrian circulation, uh, but I think moving forward, I would certainly encourage, again, given the scale and density of this project that we need, uh, we, we need to have that pedestrian circulation and amenities included in the project. You know, I, I would just mention, for example, uh, I was looking at the Central District uh, plan, which was developed back in, I think, two, two, 2007. Uh, portions of riverfront crossings used to be in riverfront, uh, riverfront crossings, portions of that used to be in the Central District. And in one of the maps in that plan, uh, they indicated an area which, which was scheduled or uh, defined as redevelopment, high-density multifamily. And, and one of the reasons that was stated for why that area, and this would be the area south of Burlington Street, the student apartments there, was the, the lack of open space and pedestrian circulation and amenities. So it, I think that sp speaks to the importance of those two features in any site plan, but I think particularly when you're uh, talking about a, a high density development um, are especially critical. <clears throat> so I'll leave it at that. You know, I, I look forward to see how, I, how the, the staff work with the developer and coming up with a plan that um, uh, has an opportunity to be something that does match up as, as um, I think we would all like with the comprehensive plan and the zoning code and create a high quality uh, living environment for the residents. I have uh, very similar concerns uh, uh, with Councillor Thomas, uh, particularly about the open and outdoor space and, and the pedestrian circulation, the walkability. We as a council and a city have been all about uh, walkability and, and trails in, in the community, in the area. So I think it, it's very important to, to keep that in mind with this development uh, and the mass of the building. He mentioned that too. Um, otherwise, I, I was, uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So I had um, questions about, you know, the traffic light signaling. Um, I, I still have concerns, mainly because it is, you know, the first street after a stoplight on uh, Riverside Drive. So it was the first street west. If 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 the signal signal was going to be even two streets west. Um, of Riverside, I wouldn't have any concerns, but I I, I do worry that a, a signal there is it may not be in the best interest. So I don't know if there is any thoughts or suggestions from any of my counselors <laughs> of what what could be done, you know. Of course, I would propose that we kind of get the commitment. I understand the um, issues that it could be more cost to the developer. Um, and, you know, once they finish a project, I don't know if there is a way for us to have them figure out what the cost is. We put money somewhere um, reserved for that and, you know, and if we go through a period of time and we're looking at the actual counts, 
um, to determine if that's needed, then either we, um, if it's if it is needed, then you know the city agree to pay the difference because you know new construction costs will be more, or we return the and if it's not needed, we return the money. I, I do have concerns about the signaling. So if people have thoughts, you can certainly share that. I remember the last time we, we talked about this, and so imperfectly because it's been a few months, um, but actually I had a similar concerns and asked questions, and I remember that uh, Kent Ralston came up, and, and I don't remember all the specifics of his answer, but I remember in part, you know, t you talked about this, the studies and that they did believe that they could, that that would work, be even being so close, because I remember we talked about that. Um, I don't remember the specifics. I remember being satisfied with his answer, though, um, which would, which led me to the, the vote the last time around. So it, it, was, it at least contributed to that the last time around. So, I mean, nothing has changed for me since then. So I don't know. That's not probably as much detail as, as you were looking for, but that's as much as I can remember from a few months ago on specifics. So I do see Councillor Dunn hand raised. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I guess this is a, a question for uh, Eric uh, in the context of, of this conversation we are currently having about signalization. Um, given what um, has happened in, in, in previous uh, zoning requests, I don't know that we're even in a position to change anything at this point since the public hearing has been closed. So I don't know that technically if i'm understanding you know the past decisions uh as well as what is in front of us right now i don't know that we are in any position to change uh whether or not it's signalized or or how that's arranged could you confirm or or clarify that yes thank you councillor dunn uh you're correct in that the public hearing has been closed and so uh we are past the time to change um, the conditional zoning agreement. Um, I think that's what you're referring to. <clears throat> and, and on that topic, I would just indicate that um, it, at the time, well, the conditional zoning agreement just requires the construction of the signalization at the time of the building permit being issued. And that's of significance because, of course, at the time the building permit is issued, it'll be clear what the density is and what we would expect for traffic counts as a result of that density. And, and that would be uh, certainly a time when there would be presumably confirmation that it will in fact be required. Uh, I too remember uh, some of Mr. Ralston's comments, um, like uh, Councillor Harmson. Certainly, I, I assume, Mayor, your concern is that it's a short block between mm -hmm. uh, Riverside Drive and Orchard Street and, or Orchard Court to the north. And I believe his comments, was, or comments were that we would need to certainly time the light so that you didn't have traffic, westbound traffic being allowed at Riverside Drive but being stopped at uh, Orchard Court because that would create quick problems. But again, with uh, today's technology on, and uh, traffic controls, I, I think they're able to um, handle that. Uh, but to address your last point, in the event that you know it, there would be something with incredibly low density uh, put forth as a development, certainly the staff could review and could waive a requirement if it looked like, for whatever reason, it wasn't going to be necessary. But I got the impression that more or less any increase in density at this location, which would normally be the reason why you would do a redevelopment, would require uh, signalization. Just, right. just a, a clarification on that particular point. Um, given the language of the uh, conditional zoning agreement is shall, I don't see, uh, is there something that's not there as to um, allow city staff to annul that agreement? Because it, it seems pretty clear to me, it says the public improvements shall include, but not be limited to, and then it increases, it's talking about sidewalks, talks about signalization, and a reconstruction of the street. So in, in that way, if we are bound to approve what is in front of us right now, I don't see how a lower density project could even result in a lack of signalization. I'm, I'm just doing clarity of all the technicality stuff here. Right. Uh, I guess I've never s encountered a situation in which density, um, you know, um, went backward. Um, uh, and, and so to be clear, I'm, I'm laying out a hypothetical that I think has almost zero chance of uh, coming to fruition. But you are correct, Councillor Dunn. I mean, the language shall is being used. And in the event that staff 
decided that it was no longer necessary, I suspect we would want to come back to council and explain why. Um, and, you know, at least give you notification, perhaps seek your approval for being able to waive that. Um, that said, I'm also aware that, for example, the earlier uh, rezoning uh, application for the what I'll characterize as a southern portion of uh, this area included uh, things such as a 30-foot wide pedestrian easement walkway and so forth. That'll kind of depend on the site plan layout. It might be that ultimately that's really not the, um, uh, the best way to approach this. Um, and uh, that kind of thing is the kind of thing that staff considers with some frequency and, you know, th that's why they're uh, the experts and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, I think they do have some ability to um, be flexible. Well, I, I just want to maybe bring my comments to a close. So thanks for all the input and reminding me what uh, Kent said. I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable in knowing that our staff, if they were um, moving forward with this project and saw that, you know, the signalization may not be um, needed, that they would, you know, bring it back to council's attention. So I'm comfortable with that. Otherwise, I will be supporting this project. Mayor, I just wanted to add that I appreciate you bringing the comments up, and I appreciate you, Eric, and your comments about the traffic signalization, because it had been a concern of mine, uh, one of my concerns, especially in light of recent traffic fatalities we've seen in the city here, but uh, you talking about that uh, perhaps they could be synchronized, that, that helped to alleviate that for me, because I, I know uh, the city and the traffic division can do that, so I think that, that would be uh, uh, an excellent answer to that situation. I just wanted to uh, say that this has my f support um, and in a slightly different um, perspective in reading the PNZ notes where the presentation was given as well as uh, the one that Danielle just provided. I feel like at the same, the, the flexibility actually is a, is a real positive here um, and that there are parameters, I mean, I, f again, we all can look at the same, read the same things um, and, and come away with a different perspective. But to, to my way of thinking, I thought there are two ways to understand transition and that it is both mass and scale and height, that that's providing some guidance. Um, additionally, taking into account what the neighborhood is and the language of transition, um, that there are some hard stops there about what can go in, um, what can't, that there are no height, height bonuses. These are all things that I think um, are going to make for a good project and will be good for the area. Um, you know, certainly we have, I think the developer, um, whoever that ends up being, uh, will have a good sense of sort of how the neighborhood um, looks and feels and the fact that there um, are explicit things to make it more walkable, to make it, to, to do these sort of public improvements um, that are in the CZA as well as um, the things that are in the comp plan and the master plan, I think are, are really good touchstones for the development. And I just wanted to say that I'm supporting this and, um, you know, I, I feel like on balance, these are these are things that can can help create something that will be useful. Notwithstanding that that, that there can be certainly different perspectives on this, but um, to my way of thinking, I felt that this was kind of helpful without being prescriptive. So I'll be supporting this. Hearing no other comments. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Uh, can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So, so move, Taylor. Second. Alter? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 10A is um, 2023 equipment shop roof replacement. 
Resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the 2023 equipment shop roof replacement project. Establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm going to open the public hearing and welcome. Hi, good evening. So um, to replace the roof on the equipment shop building. It's located at the southeast corner of Highway 6 Riverside Drive. Um, it's, just a, it's just a simple project to replace the roof that was damaged during the storms last spring. We have uh, funding in the replacement account and also what we'll get from our insurance settlement. So our project are to take bids at the end of the, by the end of the month and then have have the roof substantially complete by the end of the year. So any questions? You said the insurance is still yet to be determined. Do we have an idea of when they're going to decide? Um, so we'll you know we'll pay our deductible for sure and then we're still sort of negotiating with um, the amount that they'll cover but one of the things that we need to do is actually get the bids and have them review the bids that we receive and do i remember that the time is a bit of a factor on this because of the use of this facility with the upcoming winter weather correct okay thank you anyone from the public like to address this topic Seeing no one in person or online, I will close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Taylor. Second, Harmson. Council discussion. Get a roof on before winter. Yeah. <laughs> All right, agree. Yeah, absolutely. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 10B Sturgis Ferry Park Improvements and Southside Recycling Center. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of costs for the construction of the Sturgis Ferry Park Improvements and Southside Recycling Center project. Establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid. Directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm going to open the public hearing and welcome. Good evening. My name is Brian Dannon. I am a senior engineer with the city of Iowa City. I'm going to talk about our Sturgis Ferry Park improvements and the Southside Recycling Center project. Our project location is on 1700 South Riverside Drive. Uh, it's just south of Highway 1 and 6, uh, east of Riverside Drive and west of the Iowa River near the Iowa City Airport. If we go through just a quick project description for everyone on what's going to be included in this project. The existing Sturgis Ferry Park is hard for first-time visitors to navigate and is currently lacking in amenities. This project will enhance the usability of the park. Some of the improvements that we are proposing are a <coughs> paved and accessible parking lot, which you can see here in the light gray, a pavilion shown here in the dark gray, a drinking water fountain and portable restroom, also shown in dark gray here, we're improving access to the boat ramp by paving the parking lot access and then also providing dedicated parking for vehicles and trailers. Bioswales swales are included to improve water retention and filtration. We're including provisions for a future trail connection going through our entrance. We also have the recycling site included here, which is on the south side of the location. This will include a cardboard compactor and roll-off recycling containers for paper, glass, plastic, and metal. Construction phasing for the project is, will include uh, closing the park and the boat ramp for the duration of construction. Coordinations occurred between many different departments and agencies, um, including here at Iowa City, uh, parks, landfill and waste management, streets, wastewater, water, ITS, fire and safety, and then also coordination has occurred with the FAA, IODNR, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This project fits in with Iowa City's strategic plan, in specific the neighborhood and housing and mobility sections. 
creating and inviting an active outdoor space with unique and engaging recreation offerings is part of the neighborhoods and housing. This is being provided by the improved boat ramp access to the river and also the addition of the pavilion, drinking water, and portable restroom facilities. We're also working to grow and prioritize bike and pedestrian accommodations by including access for the bike and pedestrian trail in the future. They'll also have access to the pavilion, the water, and the, the restroom facilities. Estimated construction costs for the project are $790,000. Funding sources for this come from the Sturgis Ferry Boat Drop Improvements and Southside Recycling Site Funds. The schedule for the project is a bid opening on September 12th, award at the September 19th Council meeting. Construction start date is October 16th of this year, and it's anticipated to complete construction in spring of 2024. Um, and again, my name is Brian Dannon with the City of Iowa City Engineering Division. Um, my contact information here is here as needed. Can I answer any questions? Is the expectation in the timeline that there will be work over the winter or is it just going to start and then there'll be a pause and finished in the spring? There will likely be a pause over winter time. Um, they will, however, get hopefully get started here yet this fall. Okay. Thank you, Brian. I had a question. I was at this park recently and very excited about the amenities. And just to orient kind of the scale of this project, it looks like it's overlaying mostly the gravel parking lot area because I know there's a like a prairie area to the north that's not being impacted is that right yes um, I've got kind of here I can show um, this is the existing site um, the portion where you can see coming in here this is where the boat ramp is still going to be uh, this area will be kind of the parking area mm -hmm. with our pavilion will sit over here nothing over up here further to north will be impacted and the recycling center site will kind of sit here in, in this grassy area thank you mm -hmm. great All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Taylor. Second, Thomas. Council discussion. I'm just really happy to see this project. I used to live in that, very close to that neighborhood and, and would drive by it all the time and uh, it was, kind of a joke that it was called a park, but it was used a lot, boat, boaters there constantly, and including the uh, water safety uh, rescue folks uh, utilize that site. So I'm glad to see that you can, can continue to have the boat ramp there, uh, but to add the amenities, uh, and I think you called it and make it more inviting space, uh, because as she'd mentioned, I, currently it's, it's just a gravel drive into there, and it just just that's big open space, but really not much to it. So uh, I'm, I'm just happy to see this and look forward to seeing the final project. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 10C. Wastewater roof improvements, resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the wastewater roof improvements project, establish an amount of bid, security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place of uh, receipt of bids. And I'm gonna open the public hearing and welcome again. More roofs. Um, <laughs> this, this time it, um, they'll be at the wastewater treatment facility um, down by soccer hump complex and then we've got uh, one small roof just off McAllister on a stormwater pumping station so <clears throat> the project is it's a mix of uh, complete tear off and replacements and then also some patching so like we've got three buildings with a complete tear off so that'd be the gas metering building sludge processing building and um, then the South McAllister pump station which is not shown on this picture and then um, the other buildings just have miscellaneous patching and sealing. Um, our estimated cost is about 335,000 and there's a CIP account for this project. Um, it's got the same schedule as the, the other project. Any questions? Here are no questions, thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? CNO one in person or online. I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Taylor. Second, Dunham. 
Moved by Taylor. I'm going to give that to Don. Okay. <laughs> we heard you. <laughs> Seconded by Don. Um, council discussion. Roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Armson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 10D, code amendment to extend the time a site plan remains valid. Ordinance amending Title 18 entitled Site Plan Review, Chapter 2 entitled Procedures and Submittal Requirements to Extend the Time a Site Plan Remains Valid. This is first consideration. Can I get a motion, please? So moved, Alter. Second, Burgess. And welcome, Danielle. Thank you, Mayor. Danielle Sisman, Neighborhood and Development Services. Um, this is for a code amendment to Title 18, which is part of the code that my division administers but is not zoning code, so it does not go through the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, currently, um, the amendment would uh, change the approve the time that uh, it takes for an approved site plan before it expires. Currently, if a building permit is not issued with when, within one year of, an, of an, the approval of a site plan, the applicant is required to reapply. The amendment proposed extends that time frame from one year to three years. After that three years, the applicant would then need to go and reapply if they had not already commenced uh, construction or had the uh, building permit issued and commenced uh, construction. Um, the time frame that we're requesting grants additional time for development. We found over the last several years that it's taking longer for developments to get through the stages they need to go through internally once they get a site plan approved to actually commence construction and get their building permit. It's not necessarily that our issuance of building permits is taking longer, but there are many other factors in development that are um, anything from the design and um, materials and delays that we've just seen kind of become more of the normal. So this request would extend that period to a three-year time frame instead. We feel like that's the right amount of time. It's not too much. Um, in a greater than three-year span, it's possible that the city might adopt new codes that would affect site planning, and we would want those new codes to be applied to new developments. So um, we're fairly certain that three years is enough time, but not too much. Any questions? Are there currently any places in Iowa City that this would, like how many this would impact, like current site plans that are out? Uh, that we, there's been several that have gotten close. Um, one that has actually just changed ownership over the time, and so it's a little unique, but we found that we've had to remind folks uh, that their they're one year is getting close, and we've had two or three in the last two or three years, which is a lot more than we've ever seen have that problem, so. And, and waivers were allowed you could there's, wait. You could extend, I guess, extensions. Uh, I don't believe there's an extension allowed for a site plan, and you either do it within the time frame or it expires. And so then they're reapplying for the, exactly the same plan, and we're spending staff time to review it. And the fee structure is not yeah. such that it really makes much difference. We don't do plan reviews to make money, um, so it's really just been more of a waste of time for everybody to re-review something that's just simply a little stale, but not needing to be changed yet. Great. Is this? Comparable, Danielle, to say Coralville and North Liberty. You know? I'm not sure that we've checked every jurisdiction to see how they do it. Um, every jurisdiction has got a slightly different process for site plan review. Um, so, I, like I said, I don't think it's an extremely long period of time. If anything, one year might have been a shorter than average period of time for a site plan. Okay. I have a really ignorant question. You said one year and three years, and in the resolution, it's 18 months and 42 months? So it's there's two things that can trigger it to be okay. Either okay. you get your building permit, or you get your building permit, and you start your, your construction. So we're just moving all of those brackets forward to add time to them. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? CNO one in person or online council discussion. I think that uh, obviously some of the reasons given make sense. The only thing that gives me a little bit of pause is we're getting ready to do a comprehensive plan, which may involve us changing up some of, you know, could have some impact on what we have maybe current site plans. So things like three years out from now, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that that might be. We might be tripping over over some stuff that that we 
we may change. We may want to change and have the flexibility to be able to change. So if it's, I don't know that we're talking probably a huge number of projects, or maybe a handful um, that would that would have that. That, that. That's the one thought that I had when I was reading this. It's like, you know, with the comp plan review coming up starting, you know, January or sure. Sure, whenever. If you'd like, yeah, the comp sure. plan of process will be a multi-year process itself. Simply changing the comp plan wouldn't change any of the site development standards. That would be zoning code changes. So that would be time on top of after comp plan is finished. So okay. anything likely approved during the comp planning process is going to probably be built by the time we get to changing the site development standards to reflect anything that the comp plan may have said um, the vision should be different for. They're, they're kind of independent components of the development process. I don't know if that allays your concerns, but I think the timeline bit, for the bit. comp plan changes is going to be much longer than any project that's in that pipeline while that's happening. Sure, kind of. I just want to make sure we weren't like, you know, chaining ourselves to something that maybe 18 months or two years from now, we'd be like, oh, we want to do something different with that part of the city, you know, especially since we're talking about stuff like that already earlier tonight. So, so those kinds of visioning changes have to trickle down through zoning. So something that's zoned for that use, even if you change the vision for that area, it's still allowed to be that use. So it wouldn't really, the comp plan wouldn't affect those things anyway. Okay. I guess right. asked, asked a different way, Danielle, if we... Um, if we implement significant zoning code changes because of the changes to the comp plan, which I understand would be years down the road, as we approach that, we could change this time frame at some point in the future. Right, or depending on the code changes you're considering, there's moratoriums that could go into effect to mm -hmm. forestall something getting approved when we know it's going to be impacted by the kinds of things that might be under consideration at that time. But I don't think a comp plan are the kinds of things that a moratorium would need to be involved with. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other comments by council? Great question. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10E, setting fines for criminal disorderly house violations. Ordinance amending Title Eight entitled Police Regulations, Chapter 5 entitled Miscellaneous Offenses to specify the criminal penalty for disorderly house violations. This is the second consideration. Could I get a motion, please? So moved, Alter. Second, Thomas. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Say no one in person or online. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Actually, Taylor. Oh, sorry. Oh. I do apologize. Do I just I had a question because I was looking at. Sorry, let me get to the right page. Um, this is my own faulty memory. Did we land on just keeping the fines as were proposed or because I know we had a long discussion and I thought we had actually moved them down slightly. There was quite a bit of discussion but the council uh, eventually settled on just keeping them as okay. was. Okay, thank you for the reminder. I apologize for That's my fine. memory. No, no worries. Roll call please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? No. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes six to one. Item number 10F, adding new fee for electric vehicle charging. Ordinance amendment title three, finances, taxation, and fees. Chapter four, schedule of fees, rates, charges, bonds, fines, and penalties. Section eight, parking to add a new fee for electric vehicle charging. This is the second consideration. Can I get a motion, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Alter. All right, and welcome. Hello, everyone. Mark Rummel, Associate Director for Transportation Services. Um, so Darian explained uh, this item for you a couple weeks ago. There was just a couple questions that popped up, so I was here to try and help answer some of those. Uh, one question was about the 16 cent fee per kilowatt hour and just a breakdown of that. So that will break down to nine cents for the electricity, four cents, this is by kilowatt hour, four cents uh, for the charge point uh, fees that would be paying them, uh, and three cents for the state tax. That's that's uh, the new tax that 
is kind of the drive on this one. Uh, another question was just kind of a breakdown of what a, a parker will experience for charge, I guess, on this. So if someone parks for four hours, which uh, right now our, our maximum limits are four hours in each of these spots, a four-hour four hour session will cost the driver um, four dollars, and that breakdown would be two twenty-five for the electricity, one dollar for the charge point fees, and seventy-five cents for the tax. Um, so, in addition to the fee for the electricity, basically, uh, we also charge a, a fee for the parking. So, depending on where they're parked, if it's one of our gated facilities, um, that's the first hours free, and then it's a dollar an hour after that. So, again, if someone's there four hours, um, if they go over that four hours, well, if they're there four hours, it'll be the three dollar uh, fee for the parking. Um, if they go slightly over that, it'd be $4. Um, the other two facilities that are not gated, the Chauncey Swan facility and the Harrison Street, um, are $0.75 cents an hour. So again, a four-hour charge on that would be $3. Um, another question was about the breakdown for the, the kilowatt hours. Um, I, I think it was just kind of the, the charging um, breakdown. So it, just kind of rough numbers on this one. If it's a plug-in hybrid, um, those would be, uh, and that's a, a vehicle that has uh, gas power and, and electricity combination. So that would be about um, a two to four hour charge to get it uh, to 100%. Where an all battery vehicle, it depends on the vehicle and the battery sizes, but they could get between like a 30 and 60% charge. Um, over that same four hour span. And um, the plug-in hybrids usually get about 20 to tw 25 to 50 miles on that range where the all battery is more like an 80 to 100 mile, just again, depending on the vehicle itself. Um, I think those were the specific questions from, last, from uh, the last council meeting. I'm happy to help answer any other questions if anyone has any. I just have kind of a crazy question uh, showing my lack of knowledge on the exact state tax rules. Now, we have our charging stations that we have our electric vehicles uh, plugged into. Are, are, are we paying ourselves for the electricity? We, we probably have to pay that state tax then on, on those charging stations and, and our vehicles. How is that going to work? Uh, my memory is that if it's for kind of fleet use for your own vehicle, that oh, they're okay. not. And I believe that we've those charges are all separate. Okay. Is that right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as far as I understand, too, it's it's public charger charging stations, and um, it, it is not something that we pay for the city fleet vehicles either. So. Right. So in summary, we don't pay the tax to charge our own vehicles in our own dedicated chargers. But mm -hmm. if we were to pull in for whatever reason in one of those public spots to charge one of our vehicles, we would be paying tax. Okay. Thank you. Because there's a place where we're selling. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Correct. Okay. Well, okay. and frankly, even if we were giving it away, we would still be charged that tax. The tax. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think you're good. Thank right. you. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Say no one in person or online. Council discussion. This is one of those like issues that I, this hits me as very strange because we ha we're in a state that like subsidizes to a great deal ethanol, <laughs> um, and without saying whether it, you know for or against that, it seems a little bit annoying to me that the state is doing putting this tax on when, you know, something that's tr greener than ethanol, I think, you know, for the most part. Um, and then so kind of going back and forth, like on one hand, you know, it's about $10,000, I think a year was, if I remember that number right from, from the discussions and from the materials, you know, I don't know. It just, it's not that I think we're doing the wrong thing. It just annoys me to be put in the place of doing it, having to do it in the first place, um, you know, and so kind of hoping that, yeah, just, it's just just a weird a weird thing that that function of being in the state of Iowa I guess that uh, you know they're they're putting this on electric vehicles and yet we spend oodles of money on on ethanol uh, you know uh, un, under the the uh, logic of it being a renewable fuel it seems a little bit annoying that the state is like now going to be charging for this instead of just subsidizing it with the huge what huge surplus we hear about in Des Moines 
if I may, just uh, everything you said is true. Um, but since the public works folks are, well, only one public works folks uh, person is still here, if they were here, they would probably point out that we are the beneficiaries of uh, much of that road use tax. And as the shift goes from gasoline powdered, uh, powered vehicles to electric vehicles, we would otherwise, that fund would be depleted right, sure. and diminishing. And a fair so, point. But yeah. we, we do subsidize through the tax on the pump of the state. Yeah. So this is kind of what I'm saying. So yes, no, that's, yeah. that's a fair point and, and well taken. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10G, Home ARP Amendment number two to fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 2021 Annual Action Plan. Resolution approving substantial amendment number two to Iowa City's fiscal year 2021 annual action plan. And can I get a motion to approve, please? So, so move, Thomas. Second, Burgess. All right, and welcome. Hello, Cassandra Pearson, Grant Specialist. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 allocated home art funds um, to address the needs of households experiencing homelessness and other at-risk and vulnerable populations. The city of Iowa City was allocated just under $1.8 million in home art funds to carry out those same activities. Substantial amendment number one, containing the initial draft of the Hallmark allocation plan was reviewed and subsequently approved by council August 16th of 2022, so almost one year ago to the day. Um, after review by uh, HUD, we received recommendations for modifications specifically um, in the prioritization and preferences section just for clarification, um, as well as the needs analysis, needs and gaps analysis, um, again, just for clarification of, of some of the pieces there for compliance. Um, there's no modifications to any funding recommendations or actual um, implementation of the program. Um, However, those those uh, changes, as mentioned, are presented to you today. Okay. Thank you. Pat, any questions any for Cassandra? Hearing none, thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion? Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes. Seven to zero. <laughs> Item number 11 is announcements of vacancies new. 11A is uh, announced um, Climate Action Commission. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Could I get a motion to, I'm sorry, before I do that. Um, so Climate Action Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2025. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Alter. Second, Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 12 is announcements of vacancies previous. And 12A is going to be Community Police Review Board, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, August 29, 2023. Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Parks and Recreation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applicants must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, September 12, 2023. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn Avenue, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. Item number 13 is City Council information. 
I just had one um, item, a plug for the diversity market final uh, market this Saturday, I believe it is, isn't it? Two, two more. Okay. Second to last. Yeah, Whew, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Missed the last one. Got confused. Um, we will be having our transit staff and um, some volunteers. Uh, I know I'm volunteering. I don't know if other counselors are volunteering to help table uh, for... <laughs> to promote our fare free transit at the market. And that will be for the full duration of the market. And we will also be having a city council listening post from five to seven at the market. Great. I just learned uh, some sad news earlier today. Um, Carolyn Dieterle passed away, um, who I, I kind of think of as a, sort of a permanent fixture in Iowa City. And uh, I think all of us are, that know her, or that knew her, are very saddened by that. And um, so I just wanted to mention that to you. Not that? Uh, yeah. I was just going to say that the, f I think it is well sold out by this point, but the farm to street celebration is going to be in the north side marketplace this Thursday uh, for those who want to get amazing food and good company. Um, additionally, that same night, there is kind of a, a get-together sponsored by Four Cs out at Urban Acres, um, and they just do tremendous work in the area um, regarding child care, and so um, if anyone is interested in that, that's going to be going on at the same time um, on Thursday out at Urban Acres. So lots of stuff going on, even in the late, late August. Yes. And of course, the students are back, so mm -hmm. welcome I'm to back. the students <laughs> and faculty. And U Hauls. And U Hauls, yes. <laughs> Rockstar Parking is, has officially ended. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. On to item number 14 reports from our city staff, city manager's office. Nothing for you this evening. City attorney office. Nothing for me, thank you. And our city clerk's office. Nothing today. Thanks. All right. Well, we're on to item number 15. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. Moved by Taylor. <laughs> seconded by Burgess. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, we are adjourned. Have a good evening. <laughs>